Hello, um, welcome to Flowers from the Farm Question Time. Um, we hope you're going to enjoy um, the little session that we've got planned for you today. Um, I'm Linda, I'm from the Spotted Dog Flower Company based in Gainsborough in Lincolnshire and um, I've got a panel with me today who are going to answer lots and lots of questions. Um, so firstly we'll go across to Rachel. Hello. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Rachel Siegfried, uh, Green and Gorgeous, um, and we farm on four acres. Uh, me and my partner Ashley Pearson farm on four acres, uh, which is in South Oxfordshire. Uh, we've been growing cut flowers and selling them for, this will be our 13th year now. Uh, and yeah, we, we do lots of weddings, we have farm gate sales and workshops. Thank you, Rachel. And um, Sel? Hi, everyone. I'm Sel Robertson from Forever Green Flower Company. I'm based in North Norfolk. Um, I run a one acre flower farm. We sell predominantly to florists, um, but we also sell to local shops and supply DIY weddings and flowers direct from the farm. Thank you, Sel. Claire? Hi, I'm Claire from Plant Passion. Uh, I'm based in East Clandon in Surrey, in the Surrey Hills. Uh, I'm also the author of the British Flowers book and I'm a third of uh, the Business of Selling Flowers course. Um, Plant Passion is on a chalky site in the Surrey Hills. Uh, we've got a four acre site, but we're currently growing on about an acre and a quarter of it. Thank you. So we'll push on and we'll go to the first question. And this is the sort of question that everybody wants to know the answer to. Foliage. This question is from um, Ros Chandler, who's one of our members in the East Midlands, actually. And she says, foliage, 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 never enough. Um, what should I grow for cutting? And who would like to start? Claire? Oh yeah, okay. So this week I have cut lots of mint. Um, the, my apple mint is now flowering and that's fantastic but the chocolate mint is always a favourite with all of my customers so that's really important. Rosemary is hard enough to cut again now and uh, everybody likes scent particularly if you're doing any uh, farewell flowers and rosemary is really important. I'm also cutting my Physocarpus, the nine bark this week and the dark colour of that is really really popular um, with my florists particularly um, and sage is really good and I've got several colours of sage um, and that's really good as long as it's going to be in a vase it's no good for wedding flowers out of a vase but it's lovely as a base foliage for anything that's going to be in a vase so at the moment those are my four favourites. Excellent so lots of herbs as far as you're concerned yeah, and, and sell. Um, so at the moment, one of the lovely scented foliages that I'm cutting is scented pelargonium, and there is lots and lots of variety to choose from. And if you're able to grow in a polytunnel, you get much higher quality stems um, for sale, and it's really popular with all of our customers. Adds a wonderful scent to bouquets. Um, the other, another thing that's really, really good is um, brachyglottis, um, and that's a lovely silver leaf foliage that's really good early in the season and through the autumn. Um, and like Claire says, the physocarpus is lovely. That is one of my favourite types of foliage. Um, and lovely, the um, purple, purple physocarpus diablo is a great purple colour that adds another sort of element to your bouquets. Okay, thank you, Sel. And Rachel, have you got anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I would say it depends what she wants the foliage for. Is she growing for weddings, events, or is she growing for bouquets? Um, I found this year, as I've had to go across to more bouquet, you know, delivered bouquet work, um, I've been using much more of the sort of thing that Claire's mentioned with the herbs, um, which I suppose when I'm doing wedding work, I'm looking for larger scale and things like hornbeam and birch and oak quite woody stems for installation so i think you really do need to consider your market before choosing what foliage to grow and when is your busy time for example eucalyptus is fantastic but it's not great um in the summer months because it's too soft mm -hmm. that's when you need to look at something like cell mentioned the brachyglottis or senecio 
which is a great um, silver woody. So you have to think about production goal. Yeah, it, it's all about what the end game is really, isn't it? It depends on who yeah. it is well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for those. So we've got another question now, and this one's quite long. The question's quite long. Um, it's Roseanne Delamore um, is obviously a new flower farmer and as someone about to embark on growing cut flowers, should I grow from Wipex outside or tackle the weeds? <laughs> That's the perennial question, isn't it? I don't want to mess or to feel swamped by weeds or to have plants struggling for competition. But I'd also like to avoid plastic as part of a local and environmentally friendly ethos. What do you think I should do? So shall we start with um, Tell this time? Um, well, I think to start with, it depends on what scale you're growing at. So I actually use a lot of my pets in my production, but I'm on a one acre scale. And really, I work on my own. I only very occasionally have a little bit of help on the field. I wouldn't be able to manage my production and produce as much as I do without using MyPEX. Um, the investment in the MyPEX means that I'm not spending money and time doing the vast amount of weeding that I would need to do if I didn't have that as part of my production. Um, but of course, you can't use that for all crops. So there, there is a balance there of using it for the right crops. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Rachel? Well, yes, I agree with Stel. You know, if you're on scale, um, one acre up, you, you definitely need to consider using Mypex. Of course, it does depend on what type of weeds we're talking about here. Are they perennial or are they annual? Uh, you know, all weeds, all weeds take slightly different um, treatment. Um, I mean, we, we use my pecs, uh, you know, in, it, definitely on paths. There's no point weeding paths, that's a complete waste of time. And we have used my pecs in the past um, to plant annuals into until we had uh, a major problem with bulbs. So it, because we have quite loamy soil, the bulbs just love burrowing underneath eating all the roots so I think you have to take a sort of approach as you know size um, and do you have a rodent issue yes those rodent issues can be quite major can't they they can yeah, yeah one, they, love, one they love my one, pets one mole can do an awful lot of damage mm. oh, yeah. and Claire anything to add um, well, I totally agree with all of the things they've said. Um, one thing you need to bear in mind is if, it, again, it's to do with scale, are you a farm or not? Because a farm is likely to be untidy and have weeds. And as long as they don't uh, impinge on the plant's growth, then that's not a problem. If you are wanting a garden setting where it needs to look nice, then you've got to be thinking in a different way. Um, I'm definitely a farm and I do have weeds and I use some Mypex, but I also let the weeds grow and then strim them when they get to the point where they're too large. I've got a wheeled strimmer that means that I can use it, but my farm is definitely a farm. It is not a garden. It does not look tidy. So I think if you want tidy, you may well need my pecs. Thank you. The aim is to strim those weeds before they go to seed, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Particularly four feet tall fat hen. I can certainly vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next question. Um, this is from Annette Dalton. And another newbie question. Um, she's about to start growing. Um, is there one thing you wish someone had told you before your first season of growing or selling? <laughs> Right, who wants to go first this time? Uh, let's, uh, oh Claire, you go first. Have you been uh, first? I think I wish I had known that actually the growing, it isn't the hardest thing in the first season, it's the selling it. Um, because I grew an awful lot that I didn't sell in my first season. And now I don't think there's any point in me growing it unless I can get it out the door. So this year's being a little bit difficult, but normally I would try and sell everything that I grow because if I've spent the time and effort growing it, I want some money for it. So actually finding the customers at the beginning was the hardest thing. And I wish somebody had not just, it, we, I'd had lots of people mention how, how hard it was to grow things, uh, but actually not how hard it was to sell them as well. 
I naively thought when I started that all the customers I currently had for my gardening business would buy at least one bouquet from me during the first year. Didn't happen. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. And Sal? Um, in my first year, I planted two beds of roses. Um, and just because everyone says, you know, if you're growing cut flowers, you should grow roses. But I wish somebody had told me that roses are only profitable if they are grown under cover. Mm. And um, really, you need to be growing them at some sort of scale for them to be really profitable and worthwhile your investment. So, yeah, don't go rushing out and planting half a dozen roses because you're not going to make any money. <laughs> Very true words indeed. I did the same <laughs> and said <laughs> goodbye to a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> Rachel? Uh, yeah, I um, uh, definitely think that you need to figure out your market, uh, your production goal before you go out buying anything or selling anything. Um, you need to, to figure out who your customers are, um, what you actually want to do. Do you want to, to do your floristry and, and the arranging or do you want to sell to florists? Because I think that you can end up just growing a whole load of stuff that you don't actually use, which is what I did. Um, <laughs> or I changed too. So I started off with farmer's markets. That's one type of flower. Uh, and then I moved over to weddings. Uh, so I had to change what I was growing. And yeah, the, the thing about uh, roses, yes, um, as much as much polytunnel or cover as you can possibly afford or, al or allowed. Uh, I really need to think about, especially with climate change, is irrigation. I know we are all in different parts of the country, but I think both Sal and Claire are probably quite dry as well. I know we are incredibly dry. If you're somewhere like that, you have got to think about how are you going to water all this? And if you expand, how are you going to cope with extra acreage perhaps in the future and have that in place? Because it's, it's just probably going to be an ongoing issue, isn't it? Climate change. I think that's something people need to think about. Thank you. Yes, I think that's one thing we've all got to be aware of now, isn't it? Climate change and, and where the water comes from as well. Um, and lots of people don't have access to um, water on their sites, do they? And they're reliant on rainfall, which could be extremely difficult. Um, yeah. right, so, um, we've got another question here. Um, people always go back to the foliage questions because that's, that's, the, that's the difficult one. Um, I'd like to grow foliage as well as flowers. So how much of my half acre plot um, would I allocate to growing foliage? And uh, we've, we've actually, this is a repeat really, we probably shouldn't do this bit, uh, but it says what type of foliage would you never be without? Um, but how much of the plot shall we go for? Um, so. Um, I really think that depends on what your market is and who you're selling to. Um, if you are doing lots of bouquet work, then you need, you're going to need a lot of foliage, much more than, you're, than you anticipate, I think. Um, and you're going to need a smaller number of varieties, but in larger quantities. Whereas if you're doing a lot more wedding work, you're going to need a lot more variety. Um, so if you've only got a half acre plot, I would say that's not sort of a huge amount really um if i had half an acre or if think if thinking again if i was to redo my bow farm i'd like half an acre's worth of foliage if i could <laughs> if i could possibly do <laughs> that <laughs> yes yeah. i've got half an acre and it's barely enough but when you are working on your own, you, have, you do have to think about scale, don't you? And how much, how much land um, yeah. is, is workable by one person. Yeah. Okay, uh, Rachel. Yeah, I think um, you probably need more foliage than you think. Uh, obviously, the production goal is, is important. Um, but I, I think many of the woody cuts are slow growing. And mm. you're picking from them and they need to regrow. You're going to need to give them a bit of a rest before you know it you'll have picked everything and you'll be out foraging somewhere won't you i think we all know about that yeah. so, 
Um, I find it interesting that this year I have used less foliage uh, than I normally would. I've been doing a lot of arranger's buckets um, and bouquets and I have not needed as much foliage as I would if I was doing my usual amount of event work where I use a lot more, a lot more especially woody cuts, these, you know, larger scale um, branches. Mm. And Claire, you do a lot yeah. of um, retail as well, don't you? Yeah, I do a lot of retail, but a lot of my retail is bunches. So if, if people want, uh, or buckets like, um, like, like Rachel was saying about, and so for those, I'm looking more for fillers rather than for actual foliage. But if I'm doing bouquets, then I will need foliage, but I don't have as much of the large scale thing because I don't do the large wedding work. So I'm talking about buckets. Um, but I did uh, invest in a lot, and you do need to invest in foliage. It need, you actually need to invest in your foliage before you start your flower farm, which nobody ever does. But that is, I think that's the key. If you, if you plant your eucalyptus and pittosporum and physocarpus, three years and Sinecio three and um, Bacchiglottis three years before you start flower farming then you'll be okay um but yeah quite a bit of it not as uh, more than people think I think that's probably the one question that people should um, um think about isn't it first before they start if you're ever thinking of becoming a flower farmer at any point during the you know in the, during the next 10 years <laughs> plant your foliage yeah. get in the ground now <laughs> Okay, so um, do I need to own a farm to be a flower farmer? And if not, what's the smallest plot I can start with? Um, there. So I don't own my farm. Uh, it would be very nice to own a four acre plot in the Surrey Hills, but I don't, and I'm not ever going to be able to. Um, so you don't need to, you can rent it. Um, it depends whether you want to be full time flower farmer or not, as to the size and whether you want to make a full-time living from it or not as to the size. Uh, I make a nice living from my one and a quarter acres, um, but I do do a range of retail and wholesale sales. Um, so no, you don't have to own your own land, um, but size-wise, it all depends on how much money you want to make. Okay, uh, Sam? So um, I'm in a similar position to Claire. I don't own my land either. I rent my one acre plot um, and I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to own any land myself either. So, um, no, you don't need to own your own land, but again, how much land you need depends on what your market is, who you're going to sell to. And again, it's about scale. If you're just going to be growing enough flowers to supply your own wedding work, you can get away with growing on a much smaller scale. So something of a quarter to up to half an acre, you could start with something like that to produce a really good range of flowers throughout the year. But if you're looking at supplying wholesale at all, you really need to be looking at an acre and upwards in order to really make a living from from selling your flowers okay, thank you and rachel uh yes totally agree with um both both those points uh, uh, we also don't own our our land <laughs> uh, again i could never afford uh to buy land in south oxfordshire or a four acre plot uh so when i actually started uh, i was on a quarter of an acre this was an existing market garden growing organic vegetables, uh, which actually my partner was sticking to no matter what. And <laughs> I just had my little plot of flowers. He was like, you can have that plot over there. And um, uh, yeah, so it was a gradual process to expand that and push the vegetables out. <laughs> expand <laughs> to, you know, four acres and grow the market, grow that market at the same time. Um, and not be overwhelmed by it, you know, learn as I went, build up the customers. So I think it's fine to initially start small. No, don't bite off more than you can chew, but make sure you have a plot that you're, you've got your eye on, you know, you've got more land around you. You can always put it to green manure or, or even just put some plastic down, but just something 
so you know you've got it in your back pocket for when you are ready to expand sounds sensible that uh, yeah it's uh, i think these questions may have been um sort of made for us <laughs> three people <laughs> both all renting land that's really good yeah. so the next question is all about muck compost what is the secret of great compost mm. who's going first rachel you haven't gone first um yeah well i think a shredder <laughs> is a shredder which um helps you know especially in the springtime when you're doing all the cutting back of all that uh woody material um, i think not piling it all onto your compost heap layering your green and browns having a very large compost heap is useful if you've got room we've got three bays um and it's about 10 cubic meters uh, so we can really get some heat going without having to turn them because no one's going to turn a compost heap that big unless you've got machinery. Uh, so those are my those are my shredding, layering. I mean, things that we put on it. We use horse manure, chicken manure, you know, all the cut the garden trimmings, uh, and that seems to you know mowings. So that gives you that green and brown balance quite nicely, and it it seems to work. Okay. Um, uh, so, don't put any weed seeds in your compost. <laughs> oh yeah, it's really not comfrey. <laughs> <laughs> like at the moment, um, I mean, I've got weeds all over my plot at the moment. It's not tidy by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but those weeds that are going to seed, when I'm pulling them out, they do not go on my compost heap, and they go into a separate pile. Um, that gets layered up in a wild area actually um, where I do want the weeds to grow for the insects <laughs> um, but what I would say is that um, I don't think you can ever produce enough compost so I think it's really important to say that actually with a flower farm and the amount of uh, organic matter that you need to put onto your beds in order to ensure healthy growth you will need to buy in compost um, because you simply won't be able to produce enough, especially once you know you're sort of starting to get up to larger, larger size sites. And Claire, yeah, no, I, I agree with all of those things. And actually, I've got another stage in my process. We're on a really windy site, um, and we've had real problems keeping down our environmesh and our plastic. That we we actually use our mypex out of season, so we cover beds when they're finished and then we plant into them um, and strim in between when we're planting them when they're annuals um, so what we do with a lot of our weeds which are the ones with the seed heads on them because i've got lots of fat hen too is that we actually mow them and stuff them in bags com uh, old compost bags which then we use as weights to hold down the plastic and then they're in the plastic, the compost bags for six or eight months. And then we turn them out onto the compost heap or under the next lot of plastic that goes down. So they get composted again. So we're, <laughs> we're making sure we don't have to move the compost so far because it's a big, long site, our site. And to get to the compost bin is uphill, which is, you know, don't ever design it like that, but we did. Uh, so we actually, we, we, a lot of the time, we don't put things on the compost heap. That tends to be for the flowers, the, the flower debris, um, and the weeds go in plastic bags to rot down in the bags and then go back under the plastic when it's put down and rot down again under that to put nutrition back into the soil. That's quite a process. It is, but it actually means you don't actually move things very far, which, you know, you're not carting around barrows of, um, of compost because um, 100 metres each way with a, with a big barrow of weeds or compost is, is hard work. Good exercise. Mm. No gym membership required. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, our next question, in fact, this is our final question. What courses have you done that have most helped your flower farm business? Um, who's going to go first this time? Uh, so. Um, I didn't start flower farming. I didn't do, haven't done any specific flower farming courses, actually. Um, but what I did do, I went to horticultural college and had horticultural training 
um, long before I start, decided to start a flower farm. So actually having sort of a thorough understanding of horticultural practice and the science of horticulture has enabled me to, you know, be able to start up the flower farm um, and grow, grow plants successfully. Um, so actually understanding, if, you know, the fundamentals of horticulture actually is really, really important to be able to make a success in this sort of business. Yeah. Get some good basics behind you. Yeah. Rachel? Yeah, I think you, you kind of need to know your horticulture and your floristry. Even if you don't actually decide to do the floristry, you need to understand what florists want from you. And the only way you can do that is actually, I think, to work with the materials you grow. Um, I trained in horticulture and garden design and I'd done it for many years before I started Green and Gorgeous. So I did have a good background, but I didn't have the floristry. And I think um, a lot of it was self-taught, but I was very fortunate to um, entice some of my sort of the florists that I really admired in natural style floristry entice them to the farm to teach um, over the years and I, I would then sit in on their, their class and participate. Uh, so I've had a whole raft of uh, amazing florists here over the years um, and learned a lot from them. Um, I think one thing that I would say it's a really good idea to do a photography course. If, if you, you need to brush up your photography skills and you do need to take, you know, you need to work on having some really great images your social media and for your um uh you know your website your portfolio um and i found that that was i did an online photography course and i found that incredibly helpful and claire well there's lots of different parts to having a flower farm business um there is obviously the horticulture and i've i've been horticulture trained there's also the sales and I'm lucky because my background was in retail horticulture. So the sales come quite naturally to me. Um, so that's quite good. Um, but then there is the floristry uh, and there is the photography and there's the social media and there's the um, business side of things that you're learning about the, about, about your, uh, your books. So all of those things are going to be needed. So don't just think, of the obvious um, things. Um, I have been lucky enough to go, I, I belong to a local Surrey Hills Enterprises um, and particularly during lockdown actually, we've been doing a lot of training sessions. Um, so things like photography, social media, branding, all very important for your business. I've been um, and seen both Sel and Rachel and I definitely say going in to see other flower farmers, seeing the way that they work, particularly their floristry, getting ideas from other people, that kind of training is really good. But make sure you have the business background as well, business um, training is just as important um, to make a success of your flower farming uh, as the other bits and pieces that are, are, are important and but more obvious. Yeah. That all sounds very good, good logical sense. I think I think the main thing is that um, before you go into any sort of business you've, you've got to get so you, you need some background in some elements of it don't you to start from scratch and know nothing about any of that you have got a real mountain to climb. Um, and it's a tough world out there. <laughs> we, we have reached the end of our questions and we're even on 57 seconds to go. So we're... Wow. <laughs> Perfect <laughs> time. <laughs> we're professional so, here. <laughs> uh, it remains for me to thank you all for taking part. Um, we hope that everybody who's listening and watching this in a couple of weeks' time is really enjoying it. And I would say that what you always need to do, and um, anybody who's watching, is look up your local flower farmer. Get onto our website, uh, flowersfromthefarm.co.uk. There will be somebody near you. And there are over 800 of us now. In fact, I believe there's 880 this week. So it is time to uh, really go for it. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks, love.